record this, um, you know, including your questions. We're doing it primarily to improve the presentation, so that's the only reason. I wanted to point out to you that this is a topic of importance to the point that we've actually have a national website called the United West. United West has been around for quite a long time. You may know a gentleman named Tom Trento. This is his primary website. You can look at the top banner and you'll see in blue a number of topics that they talk about. They're taking a tour, by the way, if anybody wants to go to Israel in May to be there for the movement of the embassy. Tom Trento, the owner of the website, is going with Judge Janine. And uh, he's got 90 people traveling, and they think they've got a couple spots. Anyway, so this is a, a seasoned veteran website, and they were, they've actually added Sharia Crime Stoppers as a page on the website. So this is significant. So Crime Stoppers, everybody's familiar with. Sharia crime, you might not be familiar with, that's what we're going to talk about today, and the fact that there would be a citizens and a police fo police partnership like Crime Stoppers tells you that there really is Sharia crime, and if there's any question, this website catalogs on an almost daily basis articles about the either Sharia crimes in America or around the world, and about the ability or lack of preparedness of lo local law enforcement to in fact understand the difference between regular crime and Sharia crime. If you watch Law and Order, which we do several times a day, uh, you know that Sharia is an hour program. You see the crime, you know there was a crime, no question about it. Then you watch as the investigators, based on the training they have, try to figure out the details of the crime, because they have to have detailed evidence and they have to have training to bring an indictment. Then you watch the middle part of the case where the prosecutor tells them it's not good enough. So a prosecutor has to be trained on crime, including Sharia, in order for the justice system to work. And then eventually the last part of the show is in the courtroom, which means there has to be pushing and shoving between the defense and the prosecution. And then, of course, there has to be an intelligent jury of peers who would understand Sharia law well enough to be a jurist. Well, we have a problem. Since uh, 2012, the country has been placed to put into sleep mode on this topic. Officially, as this, this article actually just happens to say, have the, the people who are paid to be U.S. agents have a poor grasp of the radical Islam, Islamic threat. That's part of our point here. Since 2012, when Robert Mueller, the head of the FBI, and his peers in the Department of Homeland Security and Defense uh, listened to the onslaught of the Muslim Brotherhood under the last administration, law enforcement put a blindfold on when the topic was Sharia, honor violence, uh, child marriage, uh, female genital mutilation. If the topic had anything to do with folks who happen to identify as Islamic Sharia folks, the federal government went to sleep and put local law enforcement basically to sleep. So that's the challenge we have, and that's really the heart of what we're talking about. There's a political camp component to this that we're going to touch on first, and then we're going to make sure that we touch on the impact on half the crowd in here is women. Just so you know, you are inferior. You are the property of a man, either in this room or somewhere else. As a child, as a young girl, you were inferior. You were the property of your father. As a teenager, you were tr there was a business transaction and you were sold as a piece of property to your husband who may have had three other wives. In a nutshell, we're talking about women who live in America who don't understand the jeopardy that they're under. So, are there Sharia crimes? Well, this website keeps a running list of crimes in America and outside of America and you can go to this place at any time. It also has a description of who Sharia Crime Stoppers are. Sharia Crime Stopper provides what's missing which is local law enforcement training. It does that on a no-cost basis. And just so you know, the training we're talking about, we're going to highlight pieces of it in our presentation. You're going to see the training that law enforcement in other states have been getting through our program. It's free. It is actually registered in the Michigan Standards for Police Training. Unfortunately, today, we don't have any takers. So one of our messages is for you to think about if the people in Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee and Louisiana are getting trained in the material we're going to discuss, it may be something that you want to have a
conversation with your your trusted friendly law, local law enforcement. We're not anti-police. We love the police. They're the bravest people in the world. If they don't have the training here in Michigan that they have in Georgia, Alabama, and so on, there's a problem. They wear a gun. They risk their lives. They don't have the training. So that's part of our part of our message. Uh, the presentation itself uh, will start right here. So Sharia Crime Stoppers is the organization. We're going to talk about the political system called Sharia. By the way, don't worry if, if you haven't heard much about it. If your local law enforcement doesn't hear about it, this, is, this has been uh, a topic people don't really want to talk about. And we're going to talk a little bit about the psychology of not dealing with things that can be proven to be true. We'll talk about that in a minute. We appreciate being able to be here. We want to make the case that this material, most of it is developed by a former police chief, retired, 20, 46 years in law enforcement in the military and the civilian arena, lieutenant colonel, retired, uh, senior commander in the sheriff's offices, and the chief of police for a town in Georgia. He's built his training. He's, it's not a business in Denver. He hasn't received a dime. I've taken the training. I've taken the training on two occasions in Alabama, in the two-day training, sitting with 60 policemen in uniform, men and women, with their weapons on, and they are glued to this material, and they're quite upset that it hasn't been provided to them until now. The police chief is like Sergeant Joe Friday, if you remember mm -hmm. just the facts. Yeah. He's very, very direct. He's very careful. His bibliography, which I have a copy of, is nine pages with about 15 items per page. He gives that out to the police so they can verify. He talks about original sources. His material comes from the words of the people that are Sharia compliant. People that read and understand the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah. Sharia itself, as a body of law, is documented in something called the Reliance of the Traveler. Uh, so we want to give you information. This is how they speak about themselves. Now, we could close the meeting right now because we're talking about Islam. Well, that's a religion. Well, don't we have freedom of religion? And aren't they protected? And aren't the police supposed to stay away from any conversation about Islam or Sharia? Because isn't it protected by the First Amendment? Absolutely. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are protected by the First Amendment. The problem with Islam is only about 15% of Sharia, which is their constitution, it's the way they live their lives, only about 15% of that body tells them how to pray, when to fast, what holidays to practice. That is 100% protected by freedom of speech in the First Amendment, which is an amazing part of our constitution. However, this is part of Sharia. This tells people how to behave. So these are things that are outside of the umbrella. It's not protected by the First Amendment, except that the Muslim Brotherhood and the march to Sharia for 1,400 years has learned how to fool us and think that everything's protected by the First Amendment. So a policeman, unless he's trained, will not take a second look at a domestic violence case wondering whether it's honor violence and wondering whether there's five people who should be investigated. If they're not trained, they will misdiagnose the way they're supposed to gather evidence so law and order can exist even when we have Sharia bills. So all of these things are part of Sharia. They're not protected. This is what the training that our law enforcement covers. This is what the sheriff who built the training covers in great detail. We're going to just touch on parts of it. This is all criminal behavior. We do not need another law. Is American law for American courts a good thing? Yes. Do we need it to go, to, to go and indict people for these crimes? No, these are all crimes today. So American law for American courts would mandate a judge not excuse this by, by saying, oh, well, that's under a foreign law, that's under Sharia law. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a policeman who knows how to identify uh, the crime of pedophilia. If a 9- or 12-year-old daughter or girl is married to an older man, that's sanctioned in Sharia, but we all know that's a crime. It's called pedophilia. All right. So let's talk about, for example, what happens when people are shocked and don't want to deal with the column on your right. Marianne, you're going to talk about that for a bit. Yeah, I'm just going to say a few words. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm going to say a few words about something called normalcy bias. 
And normalcy bias happens when um, our brain is um, confronted with some new material and we're trying to get a hold of it. We're trying to figure out what it means and um, might not be that familiar to us, but in the time that this is happening, if you're under stress at all, it takes even <coughs> longer to process the material. So what your brain does in a case like this is um, it buys a little time by going into default mode. A very common default mode is, oh, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. So when you're confronted with something that might be new and scary or something difficult you don't want to talk about, you think that you go into this default mode and you say everything's going to be all right. How many times have you had, like, you know, something, sickness in your family or some kind of a problem? What do people always tell you? Everything's going to be all right. That's what we call the default mode. That's a lot of the reason why people don't want to deal with our talks when we talk about some of these difficult issues, and some will get more difficult as we go on today. What they like to do usually is find out what is the most benign or the, the easiest thing or the, the thing they can see in something that's nice and, and, and pick out the nice things about new material that they're receiving. So they discard anything that doesn't fit into that nice mold. And I'll give you an example how that happens with something like this. You're, when you look at the interfaith outreach program um, that happens in, in Muslim uh, communities with the mosque, and they invite you to come and have a meal and everything is, is nice, and, and you go and you have a wonderful time, the people are so warm and friendly and you feel welcomed and you feel, oh, these are really wonderful people, and they are wonderful people. But then that makes you often discard other information you get about Islam. You discard 1,400 years of history. You disregard the fact that um, Christians and others are being persecuted today in this world. And, you know, and, and, and there's this, um, this division in your head and you can't, you know, you, you can't figure it out. But you go to that default mode, everything's okay, these are nice people. Because really, when you think of the alternative, it's too scary. Now, another way you can think about this, and in, in a classic example, is in Nazi um, Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many Jews left, but there were many that didn't leave because they looked around and they saw these things happening and they thought it couldn't happen to them. Right. They thought it was going to happen to somebody else or it wasn't going to be as bad as it, as it turned out to be, and they couldn't accept that this was the truth. I'm going to share a brief example of something that happened in my own life. Um, when I was much younger and in business, I had dealings with a medical professional who I had to interpret some contract information to him, and it was very unpleasant for him to hear, and he didn't want to hear it, and he didn't think that somebody my age would know what I was talking about, so he insisted that he hear from my boss. My boss made a special trip from out of town to come to our regional office, and we went out and met with this medical professional who's a doctor. And he didn't like what my boss had to say either. And so he told us in, in his office, with a sneer on his face, I would like to get the two of you um, on life supports, and I would like to pull the plug. Oh. Wow. Now this is a shocking, Crazy. horrible thing to say. And do you know my boss and I drove back from that experience, and we thought, to ourselves, I, well, I don't know if we thought anything, because it wasn't until the next day when he was back in his office in another city and I was in my office, we talked on the phone and we, we compared notes. Did he really say that to us? Did, did he say those words? He did. He did say those words and we could not accept that somebody would talk to us that way. To me, that was one of the biggest lessons of my life, that you can be so blinded by this kind of bias that is the way your brain works to protect you from unpleasant things. So how do you counteract it? Well, the best way is to recognize that it can happen and identify it in your own thinking processes and identify it in other people's thinking processes. And that's why we're having this conversation tonight in the beginning of this presentation. So. You think about that as you hear some things that are going to be unpleasant later. 
And then the other thing that you can do is just be constantly informed. And that's what Dick is doing. He's, he's constantly informing people, giving people the message, and that's why we're here tonight. Thanks. Okay, so this that, that's a preparation for stuff that's going to be hard to believe, and it is. By the way, Marianne is a big part of our Sharia Crime Stoppers effort, as is Tom Mitchell, who's back here on our camera. Uh, th this is uh, this is important, uh, we think, and so we want to compare that with you. So let's talk about Sharia as a political system. If it's a political system and it's been going on, it's also a military system. So part of our message is there's been a 1,400-year campaign, some of it's military, brutally military, and some of it is political. When it can be political, it is. When it needs to be brutally military, it was. So if there's a 1,400-year campaign, what is happening in 2018, the election campaign that might be relevant, and part of it, if it is part of a 1,400-year campaign, what is this campaign about? This campaign from the 600, 628 in particular, 622, to enforce Islamic law, Sharia, globally. Not just in the Middle East, not just in, the, in parts of Europe, globally. That is the mandate, and it's a 1,400-year campaign. This is Claire Lopez. Claire Lopez is part of the Center for Security Policy. You may know of her. Yes. She works with Frank Gaffney. She works with Philip Haney. By the way, Philip Haney will be with us in, in, uh, in a couple of weeks in Michigan, specifically on this topic on the campaign, on the Muslim Brotherhood, there's a flyer up front. Well, Claire Lopez has been to Michigan, and she has written extensively on something called Star Spangled Sharia. Well, what that means is Sharia folks are very, very smart. And they, by trial and error for 1,400 years, they have honed their skills. So they understand that they can move in a country with free speech, with really nice people, they can move politically to their objective. When they need to move militarily, they will. But they don't have to do San Bernardino all the time. They don't have to do 9-11 all the time because we are accepting people. We have a, a, an issue around the First Amendment, and they've figured it out. So she has built a framework that we're going to fit in. There is an active political campaign in Europe and America to do Sharia globally. If there was a campaign, what would the players be? Well, the players in America would be the Muslim Brotherhood. I think you all know the Muslim Brotherhood uh, has been in America uh, starting in the 1960s. They're an active part. We'll talk more about them in just a minute. They would pick people on the left who want to partner with them, and together they would come up with a red-green access, the left and Islam, and they would identify people like these two people. You probably recognize Linda. Linda is the voice for women, not just Islamic Sharia women for women. There's a there's an issue there, but we'll just leave it. And this other person is Abdul El Sayed. He's a candidate on the Democratic Party for the governor of the state of Michigan. Yes. Yes, he is. And he's a serious candidate. Uh, people were laughing. They're not laughing anymore. He is a serious candidate. How serious? Well, I mean, this doesn't make it serious, but it, it is interesting. Um, they love him. They love the man. They love him in Europe. He's got pieces in the, in the, in the mail from, uh, you know, he's an attractive, well-groomed, Obama-like guy. He's got all the ingredients, and so he's a serious candidate. Um, okay, well, that's at the governor level. That actually fractures the United States of America. If you have one state that, uh, anyway, but what about, if there's something else across the country, there are multiple Muslim political organizations. One is called Engage. They train, they train Muslims to be empowered, to be engaged in the political system. And so they're looking to get their first Muslim congresswoman. We have congressmen, you know that, right? Yeah. Keith Ellison, Andre Carson. Who would be the first Muslim congressman? Whoa, well, how about these two ladies? One is from the 11th district, and she's a candidate. Her name is Fayrouz Say Sayed. And the other woman is from the 13th district, and her name is... Rahisha Talib, Talib. So these are serious candidates. These are people who understand that they're part of a movement, and we want you to understand how that fits. Well, how could it, how could it matter anyway? Well, well, we do have a few local seats of government. A mosque is a seat of government, historically. We have 140 of them in Michigan. We have many more than 150th. 
We have 140 seats of government for a different kind of government, a Sharia constitution kind of government. And we know, if they, even if they turn off the refugee resettlement program, we have thousands of Sharia compliant people. Those are the people that go to the mosque. So if that was to be the case, and we have candidates, what would the impact be on women and children, in particular in Michigan, uh, if in fact there's a focus nationally on sanctuary movement? Abdul wants to make Michigan a sanctuary state. We came across an article in the last week where somebody identified, if you want to, you know, sanctuary state is kind of a misuse of words. A sanctuary state like California would be a fugitive state where you invite fugitives to cross the border from Ohio or Wisconsin and come into the fugitive state, the sanctuary state. That's what Abdul wants. That's his plaque. Well, what, what if that makes it easier? If you don't enforce the law, the Constitution for, on immigration issues, you kind of sort of don't enforce the Constitution. You kind of sort of do your own law and order, so it's probably okay for Sharia law to be yet another alternative in a parallel society within Michigan. I mean, beware of the sanctuary movement. It's part of the movement, in this case, for these candidates to promote Sharia law as more normal. Now, the question that raises the question, does anybody care? Is there anybody who's a law enforcement person, a county sheriff, a candidate for governor, a candidate for Congress, a candidate for city council? Is anybody brave enough to specifically ask the question or to identify that they know Sharia? They understand it. Uh, they have a background. Uh, perhaps they were a congressman. Perhaps they served in the Middle East. Perhaps they, um, they've done their homework. So who, this is the question, who's brave enough to stand against Sharia <coughs> at the political leader level, at the law enforcement level? How about at the pastor level? Do you know a single pastor who will talk about this? Well, we do. There's another flyer on April the 12th, a pastor, a brave pastor, Don McKay, at the Bloomfield Hill Baptist Church, will be presenting in the sanctuary, Philip Haney. So Philip Haney will talk on this topic, exactly an extension of what we're doing tonight, in a church, there's only one, it's the Bloomfield Hills Baptist Church. Okay, now we're going to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood plan, and then we're going to move into women, the impact on women. So the Muslim Brotherhood has a plan. Uh, it's for civilization jihad, and there it is. And Mary Ann's going to talk about it. Okay, you'll notice, you might be able to see on the screen, but you can see on the copy I have, government exhibit. Mm -hmm. This, this, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, got to start in Egypt in what the 20s and yeah. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yes, then. Yes. So, um, this. Do you want to be in the shot? I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> this, um, this particular document was found through some good law enforcement, and. What happened, because we wouldn't know it any other way, except somebody was in the Chesapeake Bay area taking pictures of bridge superstructures, and uh, I think it was like a toll booth op op operator, uh, security or something, that spotted it and reported it, and they followed up and found out that there was an outstanding warrant for this guy, and uh, through that they got a search warrant to search his residence, and they went down the basement. They didn't find anything in the basement, but they did find a sub-basement under the regular basement, and they found 80 banker's boxes filled with documents. Well, this is one of them. In the archives of the Muslim Brotherhood in the, in the United States. This document is called an explanatory memorandum for the general strategic goal for the group in North America. This is the game plan or how they're taking us over. This was done in the words of the people that were plotting against our government, and we found it in their own words. So this was never meant to see the light of day and be scrutinized by us in a meeting room today. This was private information that they thought was going to be private forever. And um, Mary the cover, I don't know if everybody picked up the stamp. Maybe you could just talk about yeah. the stamp. Well, the stamp is just the government exhibit. Um, it, it was um, actually part of a trial, the Holy Land terrorism trial, which is the biggest terrorism trial 
in the United States, and uh, there were convictions. Now, in that terrorism trial, uh, they had some unindicted co-conspirators that could have, you know, this trial could have continued, and, they, and some of these other co-conspirators like CARE and other associated Muslim Brotherhood front organizations could have been <coughs> prosecuted, except for our former president, uh, President Obama. Mm -hmm. He didn't go through with it, so they have remained unindicted co-conspirators. But it came out of this this trial, so that gives you a little perspective. Just a quick question: Is that document uh, was it obtained legally, and can it be distributed? It is um, legal. It was obtained because um, it was found in a legal search warrant. Okay. Um, it's on the internet all over the place now. Because I've never seen that. I, I know. And I, I, I look I know. at stuff. Yeah, I know. Um, so, so Marianne, it's important. It was in, it was brought to the trial by the Department of Justice. So they vetted the fact that it could be accepted, and it was accepted. The stamp okay, says it's, accepted it is, as evidence. It is evidence. The Department of Justice submitted trial, so it is there. The Center for Security Policy is one of the places you can right. find it. And I, I would suggest you all Google it. Look online and make make your own copy. This came right off offline. And it's not this, new. The Center for Security Policy is only one place you can find it. There's lots of places you can find it, and um, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. What is really interesting is the fact that it's in their own words. And this is the part that I really want you to focus on. Um, the Iquan. The Muslim Brotherhood, they understand that their work in America is kind of a grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers. Hmm. Now this is a pretty stunning thing for somebody to say. And when I, when I look at this and read the document, and the document was written um, all in Arabic and then it has an English translation, so that it's both there. Um, the, the thing that um, strikes me about the whole thing is that this is, this is a parasite coming to the host community and consuming the host from within. And, and it's this idea of... Um, of taking over from within, using our own institutions, our own way of life, our own government, uh, using it against us to take it in. And it's actually much more um, damaging than a military operation that comes in and destroys and breaks things. They've got yeah, all the good stuff left over, they haven't damaged it. They've got the good stuff left over and they're in charge, and now we are subjugated to them. If we go by 1400 years of history, and what has happened in every single other case right. when they have taken over a new territory by whatever means that they do. Now, these are the organizations, of the list of organizations that they talk about in this. That's a big part of what is in this explanatory memorandum because the way they're going to achieve their goals is by the um, networking with all the various organizations, and you've heard many of them, CARE probably is the main one that you hear a lot because they really do act as the public relations arm of, of Islam. And we hear the comments a lot. We know Dawood Walid, the, the local CARE guy, he's in the newspaper it seems like every other day about something. And it's a very uh, entangling network. Now, when Dick showed you the picture of the people who are running for office, they, they're all connected to these, this network, either the Muslim Student Association or CARE or the Islamic <coughs> Society of North America, which, as a matter of fact, they have their annual meeting. It's often in Chicago, as it was this past summer. Linda Sarsour, who was the keynote speaker, had Abdul El Sayed get up, and uh, she introduced him to the group and uh, told the people who were in the audience that they should give some of their annual charitable donation to El Sayed's campaign. Mm. And he, she's talking to people from all over the, the country. We know they listen because we look at the campaign um, finance reports, and they come from New Jersey, California, um, New York, uh, Florida. 
So he was getting donations from all over the country, from the, from the Muslims who were in the audience for that, that event. Marianne, where does Louis Farrakhan fit into that? Well, I, I don't know exactly. Na what well, I think the Nation of Islam is certainly part of that tree. Right. Uh, that's a, basically, if I understand it right, started in Detroit, um, and you know, it's very much a part of that. And you do see definitely the, the connections through the urban, the urban cities and the issues uh, start here in, the, in this web, but they spread out into uh, other other victimization issues. So that's why Linda Sassor, amazingly, is a spokesperson for women. Right. In general. Okay. Yeah. Now, and some people would say, well, this is the Muslim Brotherhood. This is not Islam. Yeah. That well, it becomes Islam because these are the people who speak for Islam. Uh, but this network includes everything, all the different uh, things that are going on. And the Muslim Brotherhood actually states you know, in, their, in their materials that they stand on the shoulder of Muslims. And that's their approach to things. They, there's no oxygen in the air for anybody else. Um, if somebody <coughs> wanted to be a moderate Muslim, it would be pretty hard because of just Islam and the fact that apostasy, if you leave, leave Islam or if you're not practicing the way the community thinks that you should, then you know you are blasphemer. You could be actually you could actually be punished by death. I mean, it's pretty hard to leave the, the fold. Is this the entire United States or just Michigan? No, it's the entire United States and Canada. This is this plan is for all of North America. Okay. And if you if are following the news, you know they're even more successful in Canada. They've yes. practically shut down free speech in Canada yep. almost completely. Yep. Yep. And they're it's attempting so to do it here. And again, they do it through our own through our own institutions, as if in fact look at Marco Rubio the, down mm -hmm. in Florida. I mean he's he's got resolutions that are threatening free speech speech. It's a very concerning thing. On that topic, just a footnote, if, if we were 30 miles away from here, we would yeah. go to jail. I hear you that. would go to jail. Yeah. So yeah. in Canada, you cannot do what we are doing tonight. Yeah. And we've had Canadians speak at, our, at the church. We've presented topics. They come from Canada 30 miles into the church, and they came up afterwards and said, you would be arrested in Canada. And that's where we're headed. So that's uh, the whole free speech thing is, is the way to put put them over the top if they can shut down free speech. Is there one more? Uh, you probably are, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to talk about this one because they do have long-range plans and their plans are submission. That's what Islam means, submission. And, you know, they definitely want to do it without firing a shot, as we've talked about before. Um, people are often shocked when I tell them that I'm not so worried about terrorist attacks as I'm worried about this civilization jihad, this takeover from within, this very slow um, frog boiling in the water kind of a thing that people, I'm afraid people aren't going to wake up until it's too late because it's too unpleasant to face. They are suffering from uh, this normalcy bias that they don't want to believe something out of their realm of experience is actually happening. But I want to talk about the culture a little bit, and I want to point out one thing about the culture that, that is something you can keep an eye on, and I think it can help you understand things. And I'm talking about the women's head covering the hijab, mm -hmm. and that's the covering that's just like a headscarf with just your face showing. Okay, do you know that it's a relatively modern invention? As, as far, it, hijab doesn't even mean anything about head covering. The translation of the word means curtain or separation. This is, a, this is a construct of the Muslim Brotherhood to separate people from the rest of the culture, to show that Muslims are here, to keep the Muslims together in a cohesive uh, manner. Um, you know, if you go back to the time that the Muslim Brotherhood was formed in the 1920s, which and I'm just going to make one little historical um, cliff note here. When the 1400-year <coughs> operation, there have been lots of ebbs and flows. There have been lots of times that they gained a lot of territory, then been pushed way out of someplace. Okay. Well, in the early part of that century, the um, Ottoman Empire was defeated. So there's, you know, the Muslims are really down. They're crushed to the 
to the bottom. They don't have any influence at all. But the Western influence is becoming very strong. In places like Egypt and Turkey, very much westernized. Um, Turkey, for example, at that time under Ataturk was a great modernizer, and he introduced um, English, and people learned to speak English. I was traveling in Turkey and um, met all kinds of people living up in the mountains that had never spoken to an English-speaking person in their life before, and they spoke perfect English because they learned it in school. It was really quite amazing. But now, um, what's happening now, you know, things are changing. But at the time of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, the, the wives of the Muslim brothers, they dressed like our relatives, like my, my mother and grandmother and aunts. I mean, they wore what we would call the cocktail dresses of the day. They, um, they had permanent hairdos. They, they looked just as Western as anybody in any capital city in any place in, the West, in Western Europe or any place. This hijab thing was, a, was adopted much later. And, there, and in fact, this is another interesting thing. When the Muslim Brotherhood was pushing it, remember um, President Nasser in, in Egypt? Well, it, there's a very classic thing that if you want a good laugh, you should look at it online. When he is talking to a convocation of um, people, in, in, all men in Egypt, and he's, he's, he's laughing so hard he almost fell out of his chair because he said, can you imagine, they, they told me I should get my daughter to wear a hijab, that we should get the women to wear a hijab. They can't even, they can't even get their own daughters at the university to wear hijabs. And he's laughing and he's thinking that's the most ridiculous thing he ever heard, that these women would all be wearing hijabs. Look at it now. Um, more and more all the time, and now it is a fashion statement. There, there's a, an imam at a mosque in Warren, Michigan, whose daughter has started an international company called Hot Hijab. And she has, um, she has her company in Dubai and New York and uh, Los Angeles and I mean it's a huge operation and it's a huge cultural operation and they're really pushing this and this is you know this is the this is how they engage because there can be fights about the hijab there can be people who say their hijab is being ripped off their head and they're being harassed because they wear the hijab or that they they are they can't keep their job because they're not able to wear their hijab at work. There's, you know, it is a point of engagement. And BC's don't forget that that's Macy's what's going on. Right. This is the culture. Macy's. This is the culture war. Macy's is definitely selling them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that would tell you, you might want to think about Macy's. Okay. So this is an extension. So the civilization jihad includes people who rather than put bombs on themselves as the ticket to paradise, all they have to do instead, if they're a little squeamish about bombs on their person, is to move in droves to Europe and America. So refugee resettlement uh, starts the process. Michigan is one of the most advanced states in civilization jihad because we've had aggressive migration for 50 years in Michigan, largely from the Middle East, largely with the medical doctor community. We're not the place where factory workers like in Minnesota have gone. We have educated, multi-generational, Sharia compliant families whose sons and daughters were born in America, went to Michigan, are doctors like Abdul and his wife, uh, and the man running for governor, and uh, they're respected members of the community. They're part of the academic uh, economic engine. The governor assigns them to non-medical commissions. So they're here, but they're still on the boards of the mosques. And the mosques are all pretty centrally organized. So we have a problem. So this starts with migration. Uh, we get increased uh, demands for concessions, which we're going to talk about quickly. And then all of a sudden, the empowerment happens. Remember the word empowerment. That was the word we had when we were back talking about engage and the empowerment. You saw the two pictures of the women. So this gradualism begins with the increased birth rates that people have being forced to accept concessions all over the education system. I know you're familiar with that. Uh, we got major influences in public officials. I think we can see that uh, in Michigan for sure from the top down. The way uh, the legislative the legislature, for example, does not pick up Mr. Runstad's legislation from last year. Uh, Jim put in legislation. The committee, they didn't, they didn't let it get through. 
We have government agencies. DHS is largely infiltrated by the Muslim Brotherhood. We also have candidates running for office. People want to turn off our speech and so on. So this is, these are examples. And now here's another topic. These are things that kind of go unnoticed. They're now, they were basically out there in the public space, but now they're part of the Muslim space. You have Islamic centers. We talked briefly about that. The veil we just talked about. You have all of those things. I'm going to flash a bunch of pictures. Don't try to keep up. My point is, this is part of the police getting trained. This is our police chief's material. We just use it for the citizen briefing like this. So just think about these pictures and how they mean. This is Muslim space, concessions, public space being taken over to identify. It's not just wearing the hijab, it's all the other things. By the way, this is a national program. There are people in Alabama getting this training. See if you see anything from Michigan when people hear about the encroachment of Sharia, the Sharia movement, every once in a while, uh, that was probably during Ramadan, that's I think the Empire State Building, uh, every once in a while they get to hear about the foot baths in Michigan and they hear about places and they, they really have a hard time understanding, you mean there's really a call to prayer, you mean there's really a place like Hamtramck where the majority of the city council is in fact Sharia compliant people, you mean there are murals, you mean this is America, yes. And so this is part of the training. Uh, of course, ending here. Um, so, at this point, um, we have another extension. We're talking about Dearborn. Who's this guy? This is the Muslim Brotherhood. This is CARE. This is Dawood Walid. This is the executive director in Michigan. He's not just the executive director in Michigan. He is one of the top three or four in the country because Michigan is such a powerful base for the Muslim Brotherhood. He's in Washington, D.C. He's in Paul Ryan's office. He is being arrested with Linda Sarsour within the last two weeks. He is on C-SPAN. He says, and this is the key phrase, the real terrorists in America are white men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. White supremacy. There are, that, those are brand names that are repeated over and over again. It has, happens to also be associated with people of the book. People of the book is, a, is a, a term in Sharia about people who read the Old and New Testament. Wow. Christians and Jews. White supremacy, Christians and Jews are the target. We're going to give you some information. You might have read, seen this in the news. We, firsthand, two of us in this room, were in a meeting with the FBI in Detroit. The FBI is owned by the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Leo Holman is an author. He wrote about it. And he wrote about the FBI thinks Islamophobia is a problem, and they think white nationalism or white supremacy is a bigger threat than jihad. Wow. And the article showed a picture of this very nice young woman that we saw in the room, and she is an employee of the FBI at that time. She spoke to a group of people, including the mayor of Troy, about 70 people, about 60 of them associated with the Muslim community, several of them would be from the Muslim Brotherhood. Dawood Walid is at these meetings. He wasn't at the meeting this time, but he's invited. So what does she have to say? She's an employee of the... Of the she educates the police in the room and uh, gets smiles from the head of the FBI and the new U.S. attorney for Michigan, and she says these unbelievable things. She's part of the outreach program. She explains that... She certainly was hijab-wearing, smooth-talking, and she was an apologist. For her, every, she says, jihad is misunderstood. Come on, folks. Jihad is just human challenges, human endeavors, challenges. For her, jihad is she eats too much cheesecake. She said it. We wrote it down. It was in the article. She also said, al Akbar, you guys are really over the top. It's not related to terrorism, per se. Even though the guy in the Flint airport put a knife in a security guard's neck saying al Akbar, that's really over the top. al Akbar is just an expression. We would say that if you had a child, if you had a baby, we would say al Akbar. So she said that. The FBI director applauded. The U.S. attorney applauded. We wrote it down. It was in the newspaper. It was in the article. She basically debunked, with the full support of her bosses, any information about the police who were in the room taking Sharia seriously. They don't need the training. This is all a facade. It's all Islamophobia. It's white men who are basically making this up. The problem is, it's not just the Troy police, it's the Farmington Hills police, it's the police all over Michigan, all over the United States, 
who for the most part, individual policemen are curious and worry about Sharia. Their bosses typically are not so concerned. Why? A police chief is hired by the city council. City councils in Michigan are largely progressive. So even if you are a well-intentioned, you took an oath, and you want to protect women and children, you want to learn about Sharia, unless you find a surreptitiously way to go online and get the training, you're probably not going to get the training in any formal way. We're going to go one step further. We're going to say in, the Muslim Brotherhood in Michigan owns some city councils, and uh, therefore they own the police chief in that community, and our buddy Tom has some first-hand experience he's going to share on this topic. Go ahead, Tom. All right. yeah. <clears throat> Tom is from Sterling Heights, and Tom is an activist and a dot connector. Go ahead, Tom. Boy, do I connect dots. <laughs> anyway, uh, the city of Sterling Heights is uh, pretty progressive, like Dick mentioned. And every year they have an ethnic event, a cultural event to celebrate diversity. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed in the last couple of years, it has gone in a whole new direction. Uh, just to give you an example here, I, I saw more, now this, this is the, uh, the uh, pamphlet that they give to each attendee at the cultural exchange event. They usually have it in early March every year. The program is It's a program. But uh, we get introduced to discover Jesus in the Quran to get your free Qurans. Call this number. Well, that's the free Quran that's being handed out at these events. Well, I have read a little bit about Jesus in the Quran. And according to this book, he's a prophet and eventually becomes an executioner for uh, non believers. There it is. That's what they're handing out over there. They're also handing out other, I got to call it misinformation, in, in this one flyer that's handed out uh, from the IONA at some mosque in Warren. They had a whole exhibit there, complete with an imam. You are seven times as likely to be killed by a right-wing extremist than by a Muslim terrorist. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff they're handing out. And this past, well, earlier this month, and I'll just tell you what I saw there, there's a picture of a innocent bystander talking to an imam. Who is that guy? Very gullible, very gullible person. I was there to watch the Polish, to eat Polish food, and I... The next table was this guy. Anyway, did he get propagandized at <laughs> visiting that exhibit? Um, a quick question. Uh, what percentage of Sterling Heights is uh, Muslim? I, I've got to say less than a half a percent. Really? Oh my goodness. I, I mean, as you probably know, we're embroiled in a mosque. Yep. Yeah, lawsuit good. there. The good news is there are seven plaintiffs. I was almost one of them to push back on this effort. How, how can a handful of city council members, remember Dick talked about uh, these progressive agendas on local uh, uh, governments. It's here. Uh, I've listened to this stuff. I've seen it. Um, the lawsuit is being pushed back on their seven plaintiffs. And the whole argument is, how can six or seven elected officials tell the whole city that, that they, they're basically discriminating what, what uh, they want with this uh, building of, of a mosque in, in an area that there are no other Islamists or Muslims? Mm -hmm. Something's not right, and it's called a corrupt federal judge right here in Detroit, which uh, Mr. Go. Trump, I had, had something to do with removing her. But I, I just want to finish up real quick um, the propaganda that's being handed out, and I don't want to forget to, to point out that this year I saw this whole cultural exchange, this is this year's program, mm -hmm. Several of the exhibits there were what I call the open borders industries. Mm -hmm. 
if uh, hopefully some of you know what welcoming Michigan is all about, yeah. which was started under the Obama administration, and it's called Welcoming America, and what that's all about. But Welcoming America was there, Samaritas, all these other organizations. Uh, there's a new one I saw, Omar Center. They're basically immigration attorneys looking for business. So it, this year was a bait and switch. We weren't celebrating diversity. You got, you got propagandized. And it's coming. And it's coming right up that corridor. Hamtramck. Uh, warm. It's coming. It's come into Sterling Heights, and now we're seeing evidence of it right here in Oakland County. Br uh, Dick mentioned the Bridges meeting. It, it was unbelievable, and that meeting was held at a Troy Police Department training facility. That's all I'm going to say. Thanks, Tom. It, Tom's uh, on the ground and collecting really important information. It's really, really happening. We're going to move now to the topic of women. Are they safe? We'll close up with an announcement about some upcoming activities. Uh, there are people who get it. Um, Carrie is in the room. Carrie, thank you for coming. And I know you get it. We're going to we're going to come let you chat about that in just a bit. Okay. Let's just talk about this because I and I, I appreciate that you've given us time. So I want to move through. Are women safe? Well, first of all, you're relatively safe. Except there are people who see you differently. If you are property to some of the men who live in Michigan, there's going to be problems. This is not just a problem for women who are Sharia compliant. That's a lousy life. Again, we're not against Muslims. In fact, we feel bad for these people. Think about a woman who lives in Michigan, sees freedom all around her, and she doesn't have it. But we're also concerned about the women who are not Sharia compliant. Do they really realize what jeopardy they're in? We didn't make this up. This is Leo Holman's book. There is Sharia bills in Michigan. He writes about them. Michigan is in this book. Um, this is Raheem Kassam's book, No Go Zones. He talks about Belgium and Stockholm and France and the UK. 35 pages of this book are about us. Okay, so it's not, we have Sharia bills. That's why we have this problem. Okay, the problem is men think women, all women, are inferior, do not have civil liberties like we have in America for women, men, children, all, all of us, and therefore that male supremacy leads to a culture of rape, FGM, which we're going to talk about, honor killing, and other topics. We have no time to talk about child marriages, and we also are not going to go into great detail about what the police do not have as training. Let's just jump right in. Sharia theology, Sharia law, violates equal protection under the law. That's America. That's the Constitution. Kerry is on record with just a handful of other people directly addressing in writing that Sharia is incompatible with the U.S. Constitution. That's the starting point. And we, we, all right, now, the other problem is male dominance has a lot to do with the three-letter word sex. It's a massive part of the mindset. If women are property, if sexuality has to be controlled, it's all over the place, and it bubbles over into women who do not practice Sharia. Male supremacy means women have to submit. All right, so what happens under Sharia law with women? They're not free. They're property. Uh, if they're involved in a uh, what we call civilian case divorce, they have no rights. If I'm Sharia and you, ma'am, are Sharia, I can say I divorce you three times. We are divorced. You leave the house. You have nothing. You will not see your children. You have no recourse. Mm -hmm. So women are so inferior that even civil, we're, not, we're talking about criminal, but even civil uh, items, a man can beat his wife. There's even instruction on how and under what conditions it is sanctioned under Sharia because women are property. If a woman dishonors the family as a teenager or a 35-year-old woman who wants a divorce, she can be killed and, not, and sanctioned under Sharia. Because yeah. honor is so important. But let's face it, if you have multiple wives, uh, that's a challenge. That's against the law in America. It's practice. There's another name. They're called cousins, etc. It is a crime. 
marriages, including marriages between a nine-year-old, a 12-year-old, and an older man are, are, are sanctioned. We use the phrase no-fault rape because you're going to see, as we talk about it, under some conditions, rape is sanctioned, encouraged. There's no question about guilt. And finally, we're going to talk about FGM and pedophilia. Well, pedophilia, of course, is child browsing. So let's look at what, what are, if I'm involved in a Sharia environment, I can have sex on demand, I can have four wives, oh, by the way, I can have sex slaves as well. It, it's established temporary marriages, another word for prosecution, uh, prostitution. I can be involved in rape, in the rape case, particularly if I am involved in sexual harassment or rape with an uncovered woman. There's a benefit to Sharia for doing that, so it is sanctioned and, of course, child marriages. So women who are covered identify themselves as protected species. Women who are not covered are therefore targets for men to sexually harass. So if you're in a mall, you got up and dressed in your normal way. You went to the mall yesterday, you came home. Today you went to the mall, all of a sudden there's a covered woman in the mall. Well, she's not there by herself. She's typically followed somewhere in the distance as a man who is associated with that covered woman as property. The fact that she is in a corridor in the mall with 50 women who are not covered means those 50 women in some man's mind in the mall are targets. And there's women, covered women, all over Oakland County, all over the malls. This is not Hamtramck. This is not just Sterling Heights. This is not just Dearborn. We're talking about Great Lakes Mall. We're talking about the malls over here, probably. So if you're not covered, you're liable to be a sanctioned target for sexual harassment and rape. And there's the quote from the Quran. All right, so what, if you notice, a lot of the physical attacks, bombings, killings, have been done in situations where women exist in the public domain and they're not covered. They're, they're, they're either westernized or they're just there. They're not covered, therefore they're the target. You've seen explosions in major music events in Europe. And here's a picture, we'll just go through it quickly. Marion's point was already made. Women did not have to wear Sharia covering hijabs in a secular time in Afghanistan. Force, fast forward to just a few years ago, this picture on the bottom was taken as Afghanistan went back into Islam, went back into the revitalization of the Islamic mentality and, and the Islamic state, etc. All of a sudden, women are covered Incredibly. All right. Now, we're going to talk about rape, FDM, honored violence, and we'll be done. Okay. If women are property, there's two problems. Men rape women, and the police look the other way. The notorious cases are in the UK. You may have read about them, but it happens in America, too. It's too difficult to touch Islam and, and do things fully aware of Sharia because there's no training. All right. So, for example... Uh, the notion here is that women bring this on themselves. Uh, women are the problem. Uh, this guy is an imam. His comment is, the way you dress is the way you will be addressed. You cannot send a letter without receiving a reply. So it's the woman's fault. Uh, women instigate men. This is the guy that said it. It's the women's responsibility to make sure that men are not tempted. If women do not cover themselves, they are abused, and such abuse would be justified. You get the point? Yeah. To the extent we have Sharia compliant men and women in America, in Michigan, in Southeast Michigan, this is a mindset, and this leads, leads to criminal behavior that the police are not focusing on through no fault of their own. This guy even comes out and says, if you wear ripped jeans, uh, you're a target. You're a target. Well, how many of our daughters and granddaughters? Dress wow. that way. They sell it. In addition to that, I'm sorry, what happened? Okay. All right. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Whoa. Wow. Moving right along. All right. So, for example, this the young woman. The young woman in the back gets into a cab. You call Uber. <coughs> the cab driver, if the cab driver is Sharia compliant, he thinks you are property. If you exit in Stark out, you exit a restaurant that serves alcoholic beverages, you get in the cab, the door locks. And there have been increased, there have been studies, increased rapes associated with men, Sharia compliant men driving cabs. Um, and, and there's detailed information on that. All right. 
Now, I'm just going to go through the list. The police chief will tell you the crime, the city, the state, and whether these people went to jail or not. I'm not going to do that because I'm not a police chief and I'm not trained to do it. I'm just going to give you the cities. This is women in cabs raped. Mm -hmm. This is Lansing. This is Detroit. This is um, Jacksonville. This is Philadelphia. This is Dallas. This is Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So he sits there for a long time and goes into the cases explains what happens, how they, how they were prosecuted, just like law and order. The problem is, if you haven't sat with the police chief in a training class in Alabama, and you're sitting up here in Lansing, you don't necessarily understand all the indicators and all the things you should do to prosecute the crime. Female genital mutilation, and uh, Mary Ann has, uh, is, is going to talk about it. Okay. We know that um, the statistics show that 500,000 women and girls are either at risk for it happening to them or they've already been caught. Um, and that's in the United States, so they're at risk. So it can happen that this cutting happens here, or sometimes they're taken back to their home countries for a summer vacation, and they're, they're, they experience the, the mutilation when they go to their home country. And we've had a lot of Somalis in this area through the refugee program. That's a very high incidence of FGM in Somalia. So um, as Secure Michigan, we were starting to try to think, how can we pro be proactive? When we know these statistics, and we know it's probably happening here, how do we find out? How can we even intervene and save some of these young girls who will be going to school with our daughters and granddaughters? And so we started looking into it, and we kind of strategized. Well, it's a very close community, but maybe if we could reach out to physicians, maybe emergency room doctors, which we did. We got nowhere. We couldn't find out one thing. Um, the emergency room physicians we talked to, and they pulled their, their colleagues, nobody had ever seen a case, ever come through for some other problem and it was noticed on an exam or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It is a totally secret thing that happens. And so we weren't making any headway. The fact that we heard about this first case that happened in Livonia that is being federally prosecuted, the first case in history since the law has been on the book, I believe is a total accident that it ever was found. Yeah. And I think the reason it was found, and I think it's instructive because I think it means law enforcement can have a role here. What I think happened is with the increased interest on in human trafficking, I think people like hotel clerks motel clerks were were trained and probably given hot um, you know hot number call uh, cards or something so they they um, they had a hotline to call if they suspected something we know from the court the case documents these two seven year old girls came from Minnesota to Michigan with their mothers and they stayed at a, a motel or a hotel in Farmington Hills and they went out to dinner with their their mothers, and they were skipping and happy little children, and they came back several hours later, and they were ob obviously something horrible had happened to them. They couldn't really walk. They were disheveled and very upset, and I think a sharp-eyed hotel clerk made the call. And to me, that's the only way that we could have ever found out about it. And we understand, as the trial has progressed, that uh, we never would have found out. The the doctors and, the, and everybody involved, they knew they were committing a crime. They told the girls to be quiet, don't say anything to anybody about it. You know, this was something that was going to be hidden forever the way it has been hidden. Now, the, the female genital mutilation is the deliberately mutilating the female sex organ, the clitoris, which sits between and at the top of the labia of the human vagina. And this is the most sensitive part of the human anatomy in a woman. There's four different levels of FGM as identified by the World Health Organization, and there are subsets of each of the four sections. And we don't know until we hear all the evidence in the case that's happening in Michigan exactly what level we're talking about. Um, the defense attorney is attempting to minimize what happened. But what we do know, no matter what level it is, there is scarring, there is pain, there is bleeding, there is something permanent that happens that is never going to be 
um, made whole again. And the fact is there are physicians that um, work with these women all over the world uh, and try to mitigate the damages, but they are, they are affected for life. And it's, it's very much of a problem. Now we're talking also about male supremacy. It, the purpose is to stop the female from enjoying sex and um, being, you know, it, he's uh, her husband or or whoever is dominating her owns her as one of the wives, and um, and everything revolves around um, family honor. And at, and I'm just going to mention that the, the the most intrusive level that can happen in this FGM is um, when all the external sex organs are removed and the vaginal opening is sewed up tightly except for the tiniest little hole where urine can pass out and menstrual discharge can pass through. It's unimaginable to me that people have to live this way. That is certainly something that can that is going to cause ongoing pain, infection, functional difficulties. How do they how do they rear children or can't they? Have well, I'll tell you what happens in in you know I'll, and I can wrap up my section so we can move along here with that. The way they bear children is when they get married and the marriage is consummated, the husband at his discretion takes the stitches out and rips her open to consummate the marriage. Uh -huh. She can then be sewed back up again. I mean that's that's a possibility. She has no control control over her body at all. And um, so when she gives birth, is it a Muslim doctor who is helping? Because any other man is go any doctor would see mm -hmm. it, or is it only at home births? How do they give birth? You know, I, I don't know because they do keep it very right. secretive, and uh, that is a good question. Now, I will say that <clears throat> that many of these children of the Iquan, children of the Muslim Brotherhood, who started coming here in the 1960s, they're mostly a, a lot of them are doctors. Doctors and engineers are the main the, the intellectuals that were the first wave of the brotherhood coming through. Now, in this in most extreme form that I'm talking about, this isn't the main form that's used, I'm, right. but I'm telling you what the extreme is. And, of course, um, because of the functional difficulties, there's prob of course there are problems with childbirth at almost every level because of scarring and problems, even when it isn't that severe. But, um, you know, the, there's still births. There are all kinds of problems related to it. And the thing of it is, these girls are taken to be cut by their mothers, who were also right. cut themselves. And they know no different. This is all they've known in their life. How can they advocate for their daughters when they know no different, and it seems like this is normal for them? I mean, it really is a very tragically sad situation. And it's all, you know, it's, it's all about... Honor. Yeah, think, think about Dick this. Talk the more law about has been on the books since the mid 90s. The only indictment came last year. The only wow. federal indictment. And that doesn't tell you wow. that people were, and, and we know that Michigan is a center point. The people come into Michigan to have it done. The secrecy works so well in Michigan. Wow. So you have to. You know that there either either is a complete lack of training, complete lack, lack of looking at it or there's some kind of collusion, so it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So the question remains, if it happens this often, where's the second indictment? Thank God we've got a new law in Michigan, it's three times more higher penalty, that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that legislators can react. Has anybody been trained on a new law? Has anybody been indicted? So let's wait to see how long it takes, given how much of this goes on, when will the second indictment, federal or state, happen? Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, okay, this is one of the topic. Uh, why does it happen? Uh, well, we, we talked about these things. It, controlling f female sexuality is really key. And now, honor killing gets in the way when you're trying to deal with, it's related typically to sexuality and ma male dominance. We're going to talk briefly about this and then wrap it up. So, uh, honor is everything. So, for example, if a young girl, a teenage girl, bring shame to the family, removes the honor for the family, it is under Sharia law in case that the, the following are not subject to retaliation, a mother or a father, for killing their offspring or offspring's offspring. So a parent or grandparent 
is sanctioned under Sharia to take the life of a 15-year-old girl who dresses like the lady in the back, or who has a boyfriend, or has a boyfriend who is not practicing Sharia. Think about that in America. All right. So there's lots of statistics. There's two types. Uh, typically, it's not for a sexual indiscretion. It's because a woman or a teenage girl is just too westernized, and that's excuse enough for shame to the family. By the way, it's not just shame to the family, the mother, the father, the uncle, the cousins, the community, the imam. The imam. Have you seen any imams be indicted for anything ever? No. So the imam is teaching Sharia. The family understands it, and the young daughter who's caught up in the middle in America could be dead. Only 9% of the time is there actually sexual impropriety related to this. There is the middle the woman in her 30s, for example, and the young child. We have a case in Farmington Hill. The woman is 39 years old. She and her husband have had domestic violence cases. There's a court order to keep him away. He's been told by court order to stay away from the children. The children include a 15-year-old son and two teenage daughters. Uh, the wife is so westernized that she's going to go through a divorce. It's not one of these Sharia divorces, it's a Michigan divorce. There's a deposition coming next week. She's dead. Mm. How'd that happen? Well, the police in Farmington Hills, in writing, the law enforcement officer who went after the case is an award-winning officer, in writing, in the newspaper, his only suspect is the 15-year-old son. She was dead at the bottom of a two-story building, out the window upstairs. She's down the bottom and she's dead. Originally, the police had evidence. The story was she fell in an accident. Then the story was the 15-year-old pushed her. Now the evidence says she was dead on the second floor. Wow. Well, it turns out that the father had been violating the protective order and been hanging out with the son. So it doesn't take too much energy to know they attend a mosque. It's a Canton mosque. The mosque is prominently Sharia compliant on their website until they changed it. Um, and so the imam is preaching Sharia. The father and the young son talk about it. If nothing else, the police should be investigating the father, the imam, and the rest of the family. So if you're a policeman and you indict the 15-year-old son and you go no further, that's a problem. That police department needs the training. The police officer is a great guy. He's award-winning, but he doesn't have the training. So we have a problem. Uh, we're going to go through this quickly. So the other statistic is typically um, this is the case, two Western eyes, but then you have the teenage daughter. And this is unfortunately the case where the father typically kills the daughter. Um, if the father is killing the daughter, in this case, again, the mother knows the cousin who she was supposed to marry that probably she doesn't want to marry knows, and certainly the imam probably knows. In fact, we know a young woman, ex-Muslim, who, who's giving us very specific information about how the imams relate to cases like this. They typically bring the father in and listen to the father. So a teenage girl who's westernized, uh, typically this is what happens, and it happens in America, and it's called honor violence or honor killing. It is not domestic violence. It's not a guy who had too much to drink and killed his wife or his girlfriend. This is a planned, deliberate act of reestablishing the honor of the family. And it's not domestic violence. The police need to be trained to understand the difference and to bring justice. Again, the goal is law and order, like on television. The problem is we do not have a special unit like they do on TV. We need a special crimes unit, a special Sharia crimes unit who is trained to do all the facets of law enforcement, law and order, indictment, prosecution, conviction, and that's problem. That's not happening because we don't have the training. These are, we're going to, another flyer is, by the way, we have a flyer on the table which is questionnaires for candidates. Um, we mentioned that some candidates have actually filled out the application, talked about their knowledge of Sharia, their knowledge of uh, welcoming Michigan, the knowledge of refugee resettlement. Uh, those candidates are published, the results on securemichigan.org. Um, uh, we, have, we have questionnaires filled out by a, a subset of candidates. One of them just came in the room, that would be Kerry. 
This questionnaire is different. This is a questionnaire for you to take and have a conversation with law enforcement. We're assuming you might have a son or a grandson or a granddaughter who's in law enforcement. You could ask them these questions. Which, what are the Sharia crimes that are in violation of the Constitution or state law? Anybody in your department ever have any Sharia training so they can recognize the difference between domestic violence and honor killing? If a Muslim female reported she was raped, would you as a police officer be concerned for family retaliation against her? By the way, you probably know this. How many witnesses does a woman in America under Sharia have to have that there was a rape? Three male. Four. Four. We have to be four. If she cannot produce four people who somehow can ver verify that she was raped, she's the perpetrator. She is the criminal. That's how it works. And so if, in fact, she comes forward, how do the police respond to her? Do they, just, do they, in fact, provide any level of protection for her against her own family? If a local school official reports that a young female Muslim student is being sent to the family's home of origin against her will, does this raise any red flags that she's in possible jeopardy? Again, she may be being sent away for FGM or for a forced marriage. If your officers in carriage a teenage Muslim girl who's runaway, who says her parents are forcing her to marry a much older man, what steps should be taken? How about a social worker that gets involved with a teenage runaway and returns the young girl to her home or puts her in foster care? The promise, the best way to do foster care in Michigan is with a relative. Well, if that relative is part of the Sharia-compliant family, this young girl will either commit suicide or will be injured or killed. Well, if you don't know that, what a terrible mistake for a social worker or a policeman to do. So you are welcome to take this questionnaire and start a conversation. What do we really want? We want a conversation where citizens, particularly women, talk to policemen individually and get this going. Will the policemen ever be able to get their chief to bring the training in? Who knows? Let's keep trying. So far, we are batting zero in this county and in the other two counties right around here. We have zero people that are willing to take the training formally. The training is no cost except for expenses. It is fully certified by the Standards Committee for Police Training in Michigan. It's, called, it's registered. It's been trained. 150 jurisdictions have been trained by, with this material by the retired police chief. Uh, typically, a, a county sheriff is courageous enough to bring in the departments in his county, and they get trained. And I'm fortunate enough to have sat through the training. So this is the classes that are taught on day one. You see that women in Sharia is just a small part of an ongoing Muslim Brotherhood is trained, etc. This is a very heavy duty class. They're well informed. This is the material that the FBI removed from local law enforcement in 2012, and this is providing that support. So a topic which we're going to talk about on Saturday, by the way, we will be at the Republican Women's Club in Macomb talking about mosques. What are they? And uh, this is basically what we do. Now, the important thing here, we want people running for office to understand this topic. We want them to speak out about this topic. We would like them to begin to learn and associate with people like Philip Haney. So Philip Haney is going to be in Michigan on the 6th through the 12th of April. Philip Haney is the whistleblower. He was on the Ted Cruz hearing talking about how the Obama administration removed the records he put into the database that could have prevented San Bernardino and Orlando. He is a law enforcement person to this day, even though he's retired. He's coming to Michigan to spread the message, I'm almost done, and he's going to be appearing at the Blue Hill Baptist Church. There's a flyer here with a courageous pastor named Don McKay on the 12th. On the 11th, he's also going to be appearing in Oakland County at the invitation of a very courageous man, and that would be Kerry Bentavoglio. So mm. Kerry Bentavoglio mm. is going to host Philip Haney, and, and there will be more detail in that event. Kerry, can Kerry say a few words, we please? Have be, we have to be out of here at 8 o'clock. Okay. Right? So, so yeah. two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Hey, how many knew about the awesome threat in 2000, the year 2000? The year 2000, before 9/11. I did. How many? You want me? Can I just? You might want to stay up. Oh, I did. I did too. You did. Okay, good. 2001, 9/11, right? Yeah. 9/11. I heard about okay. that one. Okay. Um, all of a sudden, Michigan National Guard is activated. We had a guy in our unit. He's a Muslim, a black Muslim. He supports Farrakhan. This is Michigan Army National Guard. He's in my unit. 
He's a lieutenant. He gets promoted under Obama. He goes from captain to now, just after Obama was getting ready to go out of office, he got his one star. General. He's a general. There is a big threat in America, ladies and gentlemen. It's really hard to tell people when you're a soldier and you've actually been in combat and put your buddies in a body bag and had to stuff Vicks Vapor Rub up, Vicks Vapor Rub up your nose so you don't handle the you can't because you can't handle the smell. None of you have done that. At least I don't think so, right? In 2007 or in 2003, I organized part of the Michigan National Guard. You can talk to General Stone. We organized the first ever SWAT team in the Michigan Army National Guard. I was the trainer for that. How to go in and take out the bad guys. How to take out the hair did, or uh, the, the terrorists. Taught by the Israeli Special Forces. Fact. But on April 11th, we're going to present some information with Philip Haney and some additional information that's a direct threat to the United States of America. It is not just simply the mocks. This is a long time thing happening since the 1960s. Victory Center in Livonia. I'm going to ask you to do me one favor. And then I'm going to say one thing about my campaign. I want to stop a rumor. Um, here's, I'm sorry about the two minutes, but this is very important, two folks. When you come to the Victory, Victory <laughs> Center, I don't want you to bring yourself or your wife or your spouse or your husband. I want you to bring some friends. Because people need to wake up. Look, I don't understand this. I can jump, a lot of my friends and I can jump on a plane and fly overseas and serve our country. And I can get people in the United States, my neighbors, my friends, people in the community where I grew up, to get out there and take notice and wake up and see what's happening. I've been fighting socialism in this country and terrorism in this country since Jane Fonda pretended to shoot down B-52s in the North. What? Okay. All right. Um, April 11th, sometime around 6 o'clock, bring some friends. We'll probably be at the Livonia Victory Center, depending on how many people we have. We're hoping to have more. We're going to uh, hopefully have other speakers as well. And we might, we'll be having a luncheon, I think, or a breakfast with the Chief of Police for the State of Michigan. Thank you very much. Oh, one other thing, campaign related. Look, if any of you people feel that um, uh, you don't, we don't have enough money uh, to win against the Democrats, any of the candidates. I have news for you. I have, uh, on Saturday, if you were at a fundraiser, we had a gentleman come in who's a member of Congress. He says, uh, Kerry, you need to win that primary. Don't worry about <coughs> raising money necessarily for the primary because, or the general election because you'll have all you need. We're going to keep this state. He's basically committed over a million dollars to the campaign. Right? But, I got to get through the primary, right? Yeah. And the hardest thing to do is get the people to come up with the money. But I got to tell you, uh, the folks are here that were at that fundraiser. Did you have a good time? That was awesome. Best fundraiser Best. ever. It was. Okay. Folks, you got to get involved. You got to go out door to door. We still need people to uh, get up there and contribute a little bit here and there. Call some friends because we have a fight on our hands, and it's not just in Congress. It's look what's happening to our country. I fought for it. I want it back. God bless right. you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank Dick and everybody involved. I don't think there is any other business. Uh, one quick, quick yeah. little thing. Um, reminder about the money. Uh, if we're going to pass, pass for the pizza, that is strictly cash, no political activity. If you want to donate for political activity, you have to give me a name and address to catch that money. This is that because we're. Yeah, this is for pizza. <laughs> and. Um, I also have, I'm not going to talk about it now, if anybody has not heard about Mike Mitchell, I've got some credit right. out stuff. And yeah. if you need to have anything notarized, go to Marion and uh, whoever else. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let me share it.